those who have swords and know how to use them but keep, choose to keep them sheathed will inherit the earth. And that's a very, that's a much better idea as far as I'm concerned because it means that you have a moral obligation to be strong and dangerous, both of those. But to harness that and to use it in the service of good. So it, it's, it, it's, it's associated with a complex set of ideas. If but that, but, not, sorry, but, that, but that principle right there is a, is a stark differentiator of you from much of the material that I read. Mm -hmm. I, generally, it's purely about compassion. You use the word victimhood, mm -hmm. but a lot of folks do feel as a virtue to feel sorry for others because mm -hmm. usually behind that is virtue I'll do something. Virtue is not that easy. No. Mm -hmm. That's the problem is that we wouldn't have to think if empathy guided us properly, but it doesn't. It guides us properly in some very specific conditions. It can also make us very dangerous because, and there's good, there's good experimental literature on this, if you're very sensitive to an in-group's claims, whatever they might be, that makes you very hostile to perceived out-group members. In-group, out-group, so, people within your tribe or yeah, outside well, with, your tribe? Within, well, within whatever group it is that you're identifying with at that moment. You know, so empathy drives that in-group identification. It's like, okay, well, what about the out-group? Oh, those are predatory. Those are predators. We'd better be hard on them. You know, it's, it's a mother bear's compassion that gets you eaten. Huh. So we can't be thinking that empathy is an untrammeled virtue. There's no, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. The psychoanalysts knew this perfectly well as well when we were still wise enough to, to attend to their more profound realizations, and that's the motif of the devouring parent, the devouring mother is, the, is a more general trope. And that's someone who will do absolutely everything for you all the time, so that you never have to rely on yourself for anything. That's not good. No, there's rules, for example, if you're dealing with the elderly in an old folks home, here's a rule, never do anything for one of your clients they can do themselves. Why? because they're already struggling with the loss of their independence. And you want to help them maintain that independence as long as possible. And that might mean sitting by while someone struggles to do up their buttons, for example, when you can, and this is the same if you're okay. maybe helping your three-year-old dress themselves. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can put on the buttons a lot faster. Let me help you with that. It's like, no, you struggle with that. You master it. And I'll, I'll keep my empathy to myself. Thank you very much, so that I can help you maintain your independence. Every single person who sets out to put themselves together ethically is a net positive to everyone around them. There's no downside yes. to that. You know, and I, my book has been criticized by people who've read it very poorly, especially chapter one when I talk about hierarchies, that I'm somehow supporting the idea that power in a hierarchy is the right way to be. And that's, there's absolutely nothing in what I've written that suggests that at all. Like I'm suggesting that human hierarchies are very complex and that the way that you win in a human hierarchy is by being competent and reciprocal. And so, and so I mean, for example, even if you're selfish, let's say, you got to think very carefully about what that would mean if you were selfish and awake, because you have to work to take care of yourself and what you want, say, in this moment, but then there's you tomorrow and there's you next week and there's you next month and next year and 10 years from now and when you're old. So because you're self-conscious and because you're aware of the future, you're actually a community unto yourself. And if you're selfish and impulsive, all that means is that you're serving the person you are right now, you know, in that impulsive way, but not the person you're going to be. And so that's not a good grounds for any sort of ethical behavior. And I see that if you serve yourself properly, there's no difference between that and serving your family properly and serving your community properly. That Those things all mesh in a kind of a harmonious manner. And one of the things that's really been effective in the lecture tour is a discussion about that idea and its relationship between the relationship between that and meaning and responsibility. Because one of the things that strikes the audience as silent constantly because I'm always listening to them to see you know when when the attention is maximally focused is whenever I point out to people that the antidote to the meaninglessness of their life and the suffering and the malevolence that they might be displaying because they're resentful and bitter about how things have turned out the antidote to that is to take on more responsibility for themselves and for other people and that that's aspirational which is kind of cool you know the conservative types 
the duty types, and I'm not complaining about them, you know, they're always basically saying, well, this is how you should act, because in some sense, that's your duty, right? That's how a good citizen would act. And that's a reasonable argument. But the case that I've been making is more that, well, there is a there is value distinctions between things. Some things are worth doing and some things aren't. And you can kind of discover what that is for yourself. And then you should aim at the things that are most worth doing. And what you'll find if you watch carefully is that the things that you find worth doing are almost always associated with an Im increase in responsibility. Because if you think about the people you admire, for example, you spontaneously admire people, and that's a manifestation of the instinct to imitate. Again, people are very imitative. You don't admire people who don't take care of themselves. Like, unless there's something wrong with you, you, you at least want an admirable person to be accountable for themselves. And then if they've got something left over so they can be accountable for their family, well, then that's a net plus, obviously. That's someone you think is solid. And then maybe they take care of some more people. They have a business or they're involved in the community in some positive way. You see, well, that's a person whose pattern of being is worth imitating. And so, and that's all associated with responsibility. And it's so interesting because it's as if, it's as if everybody kind of knows this, but that it hasn't crystallized. It's like, well, you should be responsible because that's what a good citizen is. It's not, no, no, you should be responsible because you need to have a deep meaning in your life to offset the suffering so you don't get bitter. And the way you do that is to bear a heavy load, you know, to get yourself in, in check for you now and for you in the future and then to do the same for your family and your community and that there's real nobility in that and there's real meaning and more the other thing that i've been suggesting to people and i also believe this is that and i think that the guys that have come to talk to me especially the ones that have had real real rough lives they really understand this if you don't get your act together and you let yourself slide then what kind of moves in to take the place of what you could have been is something that's really not good at all so it's not only that if you're living a like a dissolute life that you're not aiming at anything positive and so you don't have any real meaning and you're subsumed by anxiety and all of that and hopelessness but something kind of hellish moves in there too to to occupy that place and so then you end up making things worse and when you know one of the things i learned about studying totalitarian systems whether they were on the right or the left was that part of the reason that the totalitarian horrors of the 20th century manifested themselves was because average people didn't take on the proper responsibility. They shut their eyes when their eyes should have been open, even though they knew it. And they did and said things they knew they shouldn't have done and said. And that was what supported those horrible systems. So, you know, if you don't get your act together, then you leave a little space for hell. And I really believe that. So I figured something out that I okay. thought I'd tell you about. This took me like 30 years to figure out, and I figured it out on this tour. So there's this old idea, you know, that you have to rescue your father from the belly of the whale, right? From mm -hmm. some monster that's deep in the abyss. You see that in Pinocchio, for example, but it's a very common idea. And I figured out why that is, I think. So imagine that we already know from a clinical perspective that, you know, if you set out a path towards a goal, which you want to do because you need a goal and you need a path because mm -hmm. that provides you with positive emotion, right? So you, you set up something as valuable, so that implies a hierarchy. You set up something as valuable. You decide that you're going to do that instead of other things. So that's kind of a sacrifice because you're sacrificing everything else to pursue that. And then you experience a fair bit of positive emotion and meaning as you watch yourself move towards the goal. And so the implication of that is that the better the goal, the 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 more full and rich your experience is going to be when you pursue it. So that's one of the reasons of, of that's one of the reasons for developing a vision and for fleshing yourself out philosophically because you want to aim at the highest goal that you can manage. Okay, so you do that, and then what you'll find is that as you move towards the goal, there are certain things that 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 you have to accomplish that frighten you. You know, maybe you have to learn to be a better speaker, a better writer, a better thinker. Or you have to be better to people around you, or you have to learn some new skills, and you're afraid of that. Whatever, because it's going to stretch you if you if you pursue a goal, and it's and so that'll put you up against challenges. Okay, so all the clinical data indicates well the opposite of safe spaces, as Jonathan Haidt has been pointing out. That what you want to do when you identify something that someone is avoiding that they need to do because they're afraid you have them voluntary con voluntarily confront it. And so you break it down. What you try to do if you're a behavior therapist is you break down the thing they're avoiding into smaller and smaller pieces until you find a piece that's small enough so they'll do it. And it doesn't really matter as long as they start it. 
you know, then they can put the next piece on and the next piece. And what happens is they don't get less afraid exactly. They get braver. They get, they get it's like there's more of them. You can, and then here's why. So imagine you do something new and that's informative, right? There's information in the action and then you can incorporate that information and turn it into a skill and turn it into a transformation of your perceptions. So there's more to you because you've tried something new. So that's one thing. But the second thing is, and there's good biological evidence for this now that if you put yourself in a new situation, then new genes code for new proteins and build new neural structures and new nervous system structures. Same thing happens to some degree when you work out, right? Because your, your muscles are responding to the load, but your nervous system does that too. So you imagine that there's a lot of potential you locked in your genetic code. And then if you put yourself in a new situation, then then the stress that's the situational stress that's produced by that particular situation unlocks those genes and then builds new parts of you. And so that's very cool because who knows how much there is locked inside of you. Okay, so now here's the idea. So let's assume that that scales as you take on heavier and heavier loads. That more and more of you, you get more and more informed because you're doing more and more difficult things, but more and more of you gets unlocked. And so then what that would imply is that if you got to the point where you could look at the darkest thing, so that would be the abyss, right? That would be the deepest abyss. If you could look at the harshest things, like the most brutal parts of the suffering of the world and the malevolence of people and society, if you could look that, look at that straight and, and directly, that that would turn you on maximally. And so that's the idea of rescuing your father, because imagine that you're like the potential composite of of all your all the ancestral wisdom that's locked inside of you biologically but that's not going to come out at all unless you stress yourself unless you unless you challenge yourself and the bigger the challenge you take on the more that's going to turn on and so that as you take on a broader and broader range of challenges and you push yourself harder then more and more of what you could be turns on and that's equivalent to transforming yourself into the ancestral father into all because you're you're like the what would you call it you're the consequence of all these living beings that have come before you and that's all part of your biological potentiality and then if you can push yourself then all of that clicks on and that turns you into who you could be that's and that's the re-representation of that positive ancestral father so that's why you rescue your father from the belly of the beast Two major problems that people face, obviously, are suffering, tragedy, and malevolence. And so that's the other thing that you're responsible for, is that you're supposed to look at the capacity for human evil as clearly as you possibly can, which is a very terrifying thing. You know, that causes post-traumatic stress disorder in people that aren't accustomed to it. And in the mythology that's associated with the encounter with evil, it's almost always the case that the entity that does the encountering, even if it does it voluntarily, is 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 hurt by it so the egyptian god horus for example who's the eye and the falcon the thing that can see and pay attention when he encounters his evil uncle seth who's the precursor of satan he loses an eye because it's no joke to encounter malevolence you know it, it can really shake you but the idea would be that if you can face the malevolence and you can face the suffering then that maximally that opens the door to your maximal potential. And then the, op the optimistic part of that is, and this is, this is why it's so useful to peer into the darkness, let's say, the op optimistic part of that is, is that although the suffering is great and the malevolence is, is deep, your capacity to transcend it is stronger.